Good day again. We're on our study of the prophets of the Old Testament. And uh, you remember last week we talked about Moses and particularly um, a prophet like unto himself that God would provide for the people. And we looked at that as being perhaps Joshua because there's a lot that was uh, about Joshua was like that. But uh, again, in the New Testament, we saw it as um, people thought John the Baptist might be the prophet like Moses. Um, and, and some reasons for that, because they were both of the family of Levi. Uh, but in the New Testament, we see that Jesus fulfills that. And as a matter of fact, the people saw Jesus as that prophet like unto Moses, though he was of a different tribe. He wasn't of the tribe of Levi, he was of the tribe of Judah, which was the same tribe as, as King David. But in any event, we, uh, uh, we looked at that prophet like unto Moses last week, and there was a number of things, and we just kind of pick up on those a little bit uh, regarding Joshua and how he kind of fills that uh, that description of uh, of being a prophet like unto Moses. One of the things that uh, that happened in in terms of that is that uh, Moses experienced being on holy ground. Remember the burning bush. And that was where the voice spoke to him out of the bush and said, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. Well, when we read that first chapter of Joshua, we find him encountering uh, a warrior, a soldier of the Lord, um, one of his, his commanders in the Lord's army. Uh, the Lord of hosts is how that's translated. In the old uh, King James, it would be um, uh, Lord God Almighty. Uh, it's how it's oftentimes translated in the newer uh, versions of the Bible. But as he's encountering this soldier, which is a person that he's talking to, uh, as opposed to Moses talking to a bush, um, the soldier of the Lord says to him, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. So both of them had this experience of the divine encounter, uh, a holy ground. And we, we oftentimes sing uh, a song about uh, we are standing on holy ground. There's a sense of, of where we're in the church building. Sometimes we have this strong sense of, of God has met his people here uh, many times in the past and promises to be here. So there was that. Second thing was that Moses read the law of the people, read the law of, the, of God to the people from Mount Sinai. We will find that when Joshua takes the people into the promised land, he will take them up into the middle of the country uh, near uh, what is in today called Samaria. Uh, and there on Mount Ebal, uh, not Mount Sinai, but Mount Ebal, he will read the law to the people. Uh, and there will be that sense of, again, the encounter with God's spirit, but the encounter with the word of God. Um, and you think of the number of times that the prophets in the Old Testament said, hear the word of the Lord. You may remember the song we sang as kids, dim bones, dim bones, dim, dry bones, dim bones, dim bones. Well, that's a vision of Ezekiel in chapter 35 where he sees this vision of the dry bones in the valley and God says to him, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, I don't know. And uh, the Spirit of God says, command these bones to rise up. In other words, speak the word of the Lord to them, the law, and they rise up. So there's an encounter with, with the law uh, that both men had. Then the third thing is Moses led the people to the Red Sea and to cross the Red Sea on dry land. Joshua will lead the people to the Jericho River, a Jordan River, and, and the waters will stop and the people will go across. So the, there's that similarity too as well in there. Um, Moses feeds the people feeds them physically and feeds them spiritually. If you go back into Genesis, uh, I mean Exodus, where, um, uh, and really it's in the book of Numbers, where uh, the 12 spies are sent into the land, uh, you find that Caleb and Joshua each represent their tribes as they're going into the land. Um, the other spies go in, the other 10, and they bring back this gigantic cluster of grapes that it takes two men to carry. If you were to look at the symbol of Israel today in the tourism industry, that symbol of two men carrying this gigantic cluster, like you think of carrying a deer, the pilgrims bringing the deer in uh, with the, two, the pole and the two people carrying it. Uh, there's that sense in which Joshua also nourishes the people 
uh, with, with God's manna. And then uh, the last characteristic is Moses is humble. And when you read this first chapter of Joshua, you find a man here who does not, he's not presumptuous about how he's going to lead the people. He's scared of leading the people. And we get this encouraging word that we're going to talk about a little bit more. Uh, when, he, when he comes before God and God says to him, you, you lead the people. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to strengthen you. Uh, and you will succeed in what you do. Not because you're all that capable, although Joshua was capable. He had military science back at the time of the Exodus in the wilderness and leading the people. Uh, Joshua was oftentimes in command of the troops. Uh, Moses was the commander-in-chief, I guess you could say, but Joshua led the troops. So somewhere along the line, he, he learned some military strategy. Uh, that's not the key of it as we get into with the fall of the city of Jericho. But he knew if you read that, uh, that conquest of the land, uh, he did a smart job uh, as, as he led in uh, to that land. Now, uh, that's, uh, that's how Joshua is like unto Moses. Now, let's look at some things that in that first chapter that are there. First thing, when God comes to Joshua and says to him, and we don't know how God spoke to Joshua, um, through, the, through the warrior, that, that may have been the way he did it, and, and we don't know. Uh, Moses, it was a voice coming out of the burning bush. Uh, with Joshua, it may well have been this voice of a person who he didn't see as God, didn't even see him as an angel, really. He saw him as a warrior. But the word that comes to him is, fear not. Fear not. Now, ironically, that phrase, fear not, is found more than any other phrase, any other single phrase in the whole Bible. Can you imagine that? It, the first time we find it is in um, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, where God speaks that very word to Abraham and says, fear not. And we're going to find it again uh, when Hagar is cast out of the house because Sarah is jealous of her and she's out in the wilderness by herself and the angel of the Lord comes to her and says, fear not. It's going to happen again when Isaac uh, is, um, is in trouble and, and God says to him, fear not. It will happen to uh, Jacob uh, when he's wrestling with uh, an angel but more when, he's, when Joseph, his son, has been sold into slavery in Egypt and God appears to him and says, fear not. A uh, number of times in the book of Genesis as well as going through the rest. Think of it as when Mary was told by the angel she was going to have the baby and the angel greeted her and said, fear not. The angels appeared to the shepherds and their word to the shepherd was, fear not. So there is this word of assurance that God gives to his special people not to be afraid. And they share that word with God's people to tell them, to encourage them so that they're not fearful. Now, with that comes a sense of who we are. God is the one who speaks to us in our fears to tell us that he is with us and being with us we will not be forsaken. Remember, Jesus, when he uh, left his disciples, said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you till the very end. A uh, strong word of comfort in, in terms of, of them. It helps us to know who we are as we know who God is. Second thing is that encounter. And we talked about that a little bit already. A Moses' encounter at the burning bush, but there were other times when Moses encountered God. There were other times when jo uh, Joseph Joshua encountered God as well. But that angel or that um, uh, leader, uh, warrior of God uh, comes to him and encounters him and it becomes a word of insurance. Now, it can happen in visions. It can happen in dreams. Remember Joseph, uh, the father of Jesus uh, in the New Testament, had the dream. Um, Mary uh, encountered the angel, but Joseph had a dream. The wise men saw a star 
but when they got to Bethlehem, they had a dream. Uh, and God can speak to us in different ways. Um, don't take lightly that God wants to communicate something. There's an encounter. And if we're going to lead God's people, there needs to be times when we encounter. It doesn't happen every day. It won't happen every Sunday when you're in church and sharing the worship. You're not going to go away floating on the clouds every week. But there will be days, and maybe it'll be a time of great testing, when God's Spirit will bear witness, as Paul says, with your spirit. And, and you have this sense of God's presence in your life. Uh, that, was, that was for Joseph, Joshua as, as he encountered it uh, in, in terms of leading the people. Um, you may remember uh, Dale Evans, uh, Dale Evans Rogers. Um, she's married to Roy Rogers, that's my hero. Um, Dale Evans wrote a book when um, they had had some rough times in their life. Both of them, both Roy and Dale, had had rough times. Um, Dale had gone through a broken marriage, uh, raising a, a, a single mother as a child, uh, raising a child. Roy had lost his wife to illness and was left with a number of children. Uh, they had married and they had one child named Robin and she uh, was uh, a Down syndrome child and uh, had physical problems. And she lived for a, a, a short time but uh, she died and and Dale wrote a book called Angels Unaware. It's based on a scripture verse in Hebrews which says, Be careful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. And Dale wrote that book with the idea that God came to them through their child to teach them. Now, you can go back into the Old Testament and um, in the story of Abraham, three people come to greet him and he sees them coming at a distance. And he has his servants, he's a wealthy man, he has his servants kill a calf, uh, a sheep, and, and prepare it for a meal. And he invites these strangers in. Now he sees them as strangers, he doesn't see them as messengers of God necessarily, but they are messengers of God. And it's afterwards he realizes that this was God coming to him. We can encounter people in our lives that step in there and they look like ordinary people but they may have God's message for us. Uh, that can happen in strangest ways, sometimes in ways that we're uncomfortable in encounter. Uh, the third thing that, uh, that is important there is idols. Uh, Joshua, uh, Moses' farewell address involves telling the people, put away the idols that your fathers, including Abraham, worshiped on the other side of the river. That is way up into what's Persia. Uh, today it's be known as Iraq and Iran. Um, when Abraham came down from way up there into the um, promised land, he had some idols with him. A long way, they're called Tephilim. Um, they, were, they were idols, they were household gods. That's what people had. God was trying to bring Abe uh, Abram to a, a place where he realized that what you can make with your hands is not your God. It's the God who makes you with his hands. That's the real God. Uh, and so there was that struggle. And, and Moses ends his ministry with it. Joseph, uh, Joshua begins his ministry with it. And when he ends up in Joshua chapter 24 talking to the people after the conquest, he again reminds them, put away the idols. It's amazing how many things we keep, like safety, like uh, safety blankets uh, um, that we don't need, but we keep them. Well, that's that's Joshua as he's leading the people. He's he's a man who is humble, and yet who's called to speak a word that says, "Don't be afraid." Uh, he's a, a man who needs to hear the word of the Lord as well as to speak the word of the Lord. Uh, to the people. Uh, he's a, a man who, as he encounters God, brings that encounter to the people so that they, as they encounter him, they encounter God and, and he helps them to put away the idols to worship the true and living God. Now, when I was at a church in Palmyra, a uh, big fancy church, we called it the Stone Cathedral uh, because it was built with money from 
the Seltzer family, if you know living in Bologna, um, we had a camp there, our own camp called Camp Seltzer, uh, and, and such. Uh, beautiful, beautiful church. In the pulpit, um, big stone pulpit that, that was round and you climbed up into it, um, on the pulpit desk were these words, we would see Jesus. We would see Jesus. Um, shook me when I first saw it, because it's taken out of the scripture, where some Greeks came to Philip, and uh, they, they had heard about Jesus, and they wanted to meet him. And in the old King James, it says, they said to Philip, we would see Jesus. Now, uh, Philip took them to Jesus, introduced them to him. That's not what the message was on the pulpit. The pulpit was, you're the messenger, but the message is not you. The message is Jesus, and we want to see Jesus. Make sure that what we're seeing is an encounter, or experiences an encounter with God and not just you. Now, that's a heavy burden to carry. I never forgot that. That every time I walked into that pulpit to preach, um, it was Jesus they wanted to see, and Jesus they needed to see. Now, I take this because Paul says in Galatians, I am in labor. I'm like a, a mother giving birth to a child. I'm in labor until Christ is formed in you. Hmm, interesting statement. That, that when people would see us, they would sense there was something different there. There's an old phrase that I, I came across years ago and it troubles me, troubles my conscience considerably because I'm not the person I ought to be. Um, but Pascal said, when a man is a Christian, even his dog and cat will know it. I, and I think sometimes my dogs and my cat, they don't have any idea what a Christian looks like. Um, but that's what, that's what Paul was saying, is that when you could see Joshua, or you could see Yeshua, Jesus, you would see the message of God. And that's what God asked us to be. Is that message of word and comfort, hope, a word that says fear not to somebody, a word that says here's what God's got to say to you, uh, a message that says you can encounter the living God and you can put away those little superstitions, those little idols, and worship the true and living God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness this day to us and thank you for guiding us and helping us. Thank you for Joshua uh, who proclaimed the Lord is salvation. And for Yeshua in the New Testament, Jesus, whose name is the Lord is salvation. Thank you for being that to all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you next week when we'll be talking about Huldah, a prophetess uh, in the Old Testament.